Well, we are blessed, aren't we? I'm, I'm so thankful that uh, we have an amazing God. And uh, I'm not here to smite other religions, but we have the one and, and true God. Though. The one who loves us, can help us, who saves us from our sin. And I'm so thankful for that. And so as we... Uh, Continue in our series. We're in part six now of our topic of reach. Of reach. We want to reach people with the Great Commission. We've been talking about uh, this topic of reach. I outlined it basically in three different main points. We talk about the man, which preparations of the man are very, very important. This is the guy who goes out and delivers the message, right? So we titled it number one, the man. Then we're talking the the mission is what we're at part two, and then. In the following weeks, we're going to talk about the method, the method of delivering uh, the message, right? And so all these are important. We want to reach people with what we know. It's always been right for somebody who knows what's right to tell other people who are wrong how to be right. And not in a hurtful or resentful, mean way, but we want to tell other people about what we know, right? If we have the water of life and we can take it freely, wouldn't you want to share that with other people? I, I sure do. I want, to, I want to tell other people about Christ. I want to tell other people about, about heaven. Last week we talked about preaching the gospel, the first part of the Great Commission. Preaching the gospel. I mentioned the accuracy of the gospel. We need to be accurate with what the gospel is. If we have a message that must be delivered to people, we want it to be accurate. And uh, so oftentimes we have an inaccurate message, don't we? We have an inaccurate gospel, and that's what we talked about. A gospel that does not save a person, but it basically tells somebody how to work their way to hell. So we want to be accurate that salvation is nothing that you can do. It's all of what Jesus has done for you. Right? It's not about our works, it's about his works. So we talked about the accuracy, the importance of that. We also talked about the articulation of the gospel. How do you speak the gospel? How do you, we, we might know what something is, but not know how to say it. Right? And so now the goal is knowing what the gospel is, how to tell other people about that. How do we articulate the gospel? And I gave you an illustration of a, of a I think Samuel and Joel and Max chimed in there, and we, we had them stand at the back of the room, and, and I put a suit coat on in the chair, and I, I, I asked them, I said, without looking at me, tell me how to put this suit coat on. Right? We have to figure out how to be articulate. And uh, kudos to Max, because at the end, we were walking out, and he says, I should have asked you, Pastor, I should have asked you, what do you know about Jack? And that would have given some details to him, then he would have been able to better articulate to me how to put the jacket on. But we need to know how to speak the gospel. Because quite honestly, there are a lot of people out there who say a lot of things, and they call it the gospel. They say, well, you just need to turn from your sin. Friends, that's not the gospel. That's not good news. That's horrible news. If I have to turn from my sin, I am in trouble. And therefore, why would I need a Savior if I could save myself through turning from my sin? So turning from my sin, is, is, it's actually impossible to do that until you have the Holy Spirit in you. Right? So we have to be able to articulate. This is good news. This is good stuff, right? So we talked about the Great Commission, number one, point one, which were uh, lesson one, which was uh, the gospel. What is it? Let's be accurate. Let's be articulate. Now we get into the second lesson, making disciples. Making disciples. This is the second part of the Great Commission. Many people say that the Great Commission is, uh, is telling people about Jesus. Well, Yes and no. Telling people what? Number one, the gospel. Number two, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. Let's look at that in just a moment. But a disciple, for definition purposes, a disciple is a dedicated follower of Jesus Christ. A disciple is a dedicated follower of Jesus Christ. It's a person that puts Christ that puts Jesus Christ before anything else. It's somebody who is dedicated to following him. Now, while becoming a believer isn't based on their behavior, 
becoming a disciple is. How close do you want to be to your Lord? How close do you want to be to your Lord? Can I share with you that if Jesus was right in this room right now, and he walked out this, this side door, he would run into my car. No, <laughs> my car rather. He would, he, if he walked out, I almost can guarantee you that every single one of you would be on his heels. How close do you want to be to your Lord? Do you want to be a dedicated follower of the Lord? Can I also remind you that following the Lord and that teaching people to follow the Lord is part of the Great Commission. And it's a great commandment. Therefore, if we are not teaching people how to be disciples, we are not obeying God. If we're not reaching people with the gospel and reaching people with the message of who Jesus is, we are being, we are in disputes. And I know that's a hard pill to swallow. You say, come on, all of them, listen, if, he, if Jesus commanded it, we must obey. And many people don't obey what it is he has commanded. So Mark 16 and Matthew 28 are kind of parallel passages. And I want to read that real quick there in your verse sheet. Mark 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, watch the commandment, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye into all the world, not just your neighborhood. This doesn't preclude your neighborhood, though. This includes your neighborhood, but not just your neighborhood. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Watch this, verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So not only, Mark 16, are we to preach the gospel, but we're then to teach other people about Christ. This is the Great Commission. Two parts, preaching the gospel, making disciples. And if fulfilled, the Great Commission makes a great church. If we're fulfilling the Great Commission, it'll be a great church. Can I say as well, it'll be a great community. And we'll have great Christians because we're doing exactly what God has told us to do. My desire for this ministry particularly is that we are a gospel-preaching, disciple-making ministry. And I continue to refine my goals and my objectives and how best to do that. But it's very, very important. Uh, someone once said, Jesus' last command should be our first priority. This is what he said before he left the earth. His last commandment should be our greatest our first priority. So let's talk about a few things here. First of all, the purpose of discipleship. The purpose of discipleship. Uh, in one word, it's the word conformity. The purpose of discipleship is conformity. Luke 640 has a very uh, wonderful verse that tells us about the importance of conformity. Uh, verse Verse 40 in Luke 6. The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Now let me read that again. The disciple, that's the one who we consider a learner, is not above his master, and the master would be the teacher. So the learner is not above the teacher. But everyone that is perfect shall be as his teacher, his master. Now the word for perfect here is a Greek word which means complete thoroughly. It's to be complete thoroughly, but everyone that is complete thoroughly shall be as his master. The student then becomes like the teacher when the teaching is done. When the teacher has taught the student everything that he needs to be taught, he'll be like his master. He'll be like, the, he'll be like his instructor when he's completely instructed. So the goal, then, is conformity to God. What God is trying to do is trying to get the ungodly to be godly. He is trying to get those who are not God to be like God. 
He wants us to be conformed to his image. And we have a wonderful verse in Romans 8.29 that oftentimes get, gets confused by some people of a different persuasion. But uh, here's what this says. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. The goal of the Christian is to become like Christ. But the word Christian means little Christ. Our job, our role, is then to help perpetuate the message of this conformity. It's to try to get other people to look like Christ himself. For years we had this, uh, I mentioned this as bracelets, what would Jesus do, right? And it became, it be, uh, I don't know, it became kind of this almost a joke, you know? WWJD, I always said that, what would Joe do? But <laughs> it really meant, what would Jesus do, you know? But, you know, what would Jesus do? Well, a lot of people didn't even have a clue what Jesus would do. Number one, they didn't know Jesus as their Savior, and certainly they didn't go through the Word of God to find out what it was he would do. Discipleship is teaching people what Jesus would do. It's conformity. It's, it's getting a person to be like their maker, right? Now, it's interesting. Some people say, yeah, but, you know, Christians are all the same. All Christians look the same. And all Christians don't look the same. Now, if every Christian looked like me, it would be a pretty good-looking bunch of Christians. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It would be a real pitiful big group of Christians there. But now, if you look like Dana, man, that's woo. Right there. Now, Christians, though, should possess some of the same similarities, should they? They should. Should Christians be forgiving? Yes. Should Christians be thankful? Yes. Should Christians be honest? Yes. How about some other uh, communicable attributes? I think Christians should have a, a similar appearance to them, but not all Christians are the same. But there's going to be a resemblance to the Creator. And right now, I'm teaching. I'm teaching Ben how to drive. Yesterday morning, I walked into his room. I don't remember what time it was, but seven, six o'clock. I remember. I said, "He said, hey, buddy, you want to go drive?" It's the only time I get him out of bed. Right? <laughs> now he actually does real good. It's his brother to worry about. But his eyes open up, and he's like, "Yes!" And he gets in the car, and and uh, we start we start driving, and and uh, and he does a real good job, and. And uh, we're driving. I'm, I'm trying to teach him how to drive. You know, how many of you? How many of you? Your parents taught you how to drive. Raise your hand. Wow, that's amazing. How many of you learned how to drive by yourself? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I'm staying with Jean and Maxine. Okay, just don't go on the road. Just everybody leave before they leave. And uh, so now I think Ben is going to be a great driver if he learns to drive like me. Now, if he learns to drive, well, I just won't say anything. Here's the goal. When I'm teaching Ben how to drive, he is learning, he is becoming a part of me. He's becoming an extension of me. So the things that I'm teaching him, when he grows up and is able to drive by himself, which will be a couple years probably, uh, when he's able to drive by himself, guess what? He will resemble the teacher. There will be a conformity there. There will be a conformity. And you want him to drive like me, I think, maybe. Not so much, but nonetheless, he's going to be a good driver, and we pray about that to make sure that, right, he'll be a good driver? Good. You know what? He can drive at 14. My insurance doesn't go up at all. No joke. If I'm in the car with him, the insurance will, will double when he's by himself. But anyway, so he'll have to pay for his own insurance. That's a, another side note. Spiritual discipleship deals with conformity. Spiritual discipleship deals with conformity. The goal is, is to become, to get us to be like Christ. So therefore, what we are trying to do as a church, as a ministry, is trying to get other people to resemble the Lord. That's what discipleship is. So one, we preach the gospel to them, and secondly, we teach them how to be like Jesus Christ. Now, wouldn't that be just a wonderful thing if everybody walked around and they just had Christ-like characteristics to them? Wouldn't that be just wonderful if everybody behaved in a way that was becoming of a Christian? That they walked worthy of the vocation wherever they were called? They had an excellence about them? They had a speech that just, that really didn't betray them as a Christian? But it was just, it was like, man, this guy right here, he just exemplifies the Lord Jesus. That's discipleship. And that only happens through discipleship. You can have a really nice person who is not Christ-like because they don't have the Spirit of God in them. 
So the goal is, is to first of all, let them uh, help them to become a Christian by leading them to Christ, and then we disciple them, we train them, we teach them how to be a Christian. Now, let me just give you just a quick bit of application. When it comes to behaving as a Christian ought to behave, you will only be blessed if you obey. You can know all the stuff that there is about how to be a Christian and not, and not actually apply that truth, and you will not be blessed as a Christian. I was reading in John 13 the other day, and, and I don't know how many times I've read this verse, and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And it was really, really good. And John 13 is kind of like the farewell address kind of to, to the disciples. And Jesus in John 14, he says, I'm going to go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you go. Right? So he's going to go off into, into heaven. He's going to ascend in Acts chapter 1. And we see that. And it's just a, a wonderful picture. And you know what? He starts with, and let not your heart be troubled. So this is like his, his farewell address to the disciples. So he teaches the disciples how to serve. He teaches the disciples how to serve. And Jesus gets down and he washes Peter's feet. And he says, just like I've done, so I want you to do to others as well. So that's the context here in John 13. And he throws in verse 17. I just love it. He says this, if you know these things, happy are you, happy are ye if you do them. You're only going to be blessed. You're only going to be happy if you do what it is you know you need to do. That's the context. It's the application of truth that makes happy, not the acquisition of truth. You can know all the stuff in the Bible and not apply it and not be blessed. So what this is saying is now apply what it is you know. What it is we know is the Great Commission. The Great Commission is a great mission, isn't it? Let's apply the truth that we know, and you'll be happy. But this comes with a cost, doesn't it? Because discipleship costs something. You following Jesus means that you aren't following something else. A pastor once told me, he, says, he said, uh, said to me, he says, as you lead your church, take a look behind you. He says, if nobody's following you, you're not leading. I thought that's really good. If they're following me, if they are following me, my example of discipleship, they're not going to be following someone else's example of discipleship. And so it is when it comes to how we behave as Christians. When we are following Christ, we're not going to be following the world. It costs something. Billy Graham said, salvation is free, but discipleship costs everything we have. Uh, Howard mentioned a verse in Sunday school, in uh, I think it's Luke, uh, Luke 9, no man who put his hand to the plow and looked back is worthy of the kingdom of heaven. You put your hand in the plow, you follow the Lord Jesus, and let me tell you what, that's costing you something because you're not going to be in the world. So this is the purpose of discipleship. This is conformity. Conformity. We are trying to get people to be conformed. Not to, not to Pastor Joe's image, but to Christ's image, right? Now let's look at the process of discipleship. The process of discipleship. In a word, this is training. This is training. Uh, this point deals with the method of discipleship, the method of discipleship. How is it done? And in 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, uh, a great example uh, of this is here. Uh, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So Paul is telling Timothy, the same things you've heard from me, heard of me, among many people, I want you then to take that message and then commit it to other people who are faithful, who then can faithfully deliver the message to other people. How do we expect the next generation to grow and know the Lord if somebody doesn't teach them? We have to teach them. I've said this before. We, 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 we ask ourselves uh, this question, and we say this somewhat um, kind of tongue-in-cheek. We say, look at the culture. Look at these kids. Look at these kids. What, what, is, what is wrong with all these kids, right? And we like to point fingers. 
And can I just say to you this morning, that's our fault. It really is our fault. It's our fault that our younger generation doesn't resemble the older generation. We have done that. How else are people going to know and to grow if somebody does not teach them? So we need to teach them. What you glean, God wants you to give back. What we learn of God's word, God wants us then to share with other people. This is called discipleship. This is called discipleship. Romans 10, 14, it has a great verse, it says this, how then shall they call on him who they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And watch this. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Can I just say a preacher is, uh, is, is a herald, is a foreteller, is somebody who is telling the truth, proclaiming it. That's also you, in a sense. You understand? I mean, I'm the, I'm the preacher. I'm the pastor of the church, the preacher. But you are also foreteller, in the sense of telling forth God's word. How are people going to hear if you don't tell them? How are people going to hear if I don't tell them? And there is a generation that followed Joshua that grew up not knowing all of the wonderful works that the Lord did for Israel. You know what? They didn't follow the Lord anymore. And when you get to the end of the book of Joshua, you'll see they, that Joshua gathers these uh, the elders of Israel together, and, and he has kind of a powwow with them, doesn't he? He sits down and he says, now listen. If you're going to serve God, serve God. And if not, then, then, then serve another God. Right? And so they said, well, we're going to serve God. And you know what? The elders of Israel serve God. But it wasn't until the first and second chapter in the book of Judges, they said, but there were people who outlived the elders of Joshua. That were the elders of Israel in Joshua's time. And you know what? They forgot to tell Disciple, they forgot to disciple the next generation on how to know and love the Lord. And so guess what they did? They turned to worshiping idols and worshiping Baal and all sorts of all sorts of bad things happened in the book of Judges to Israel because there was not discipleship. Because there was not discipleship. And so we need to make sure that we are in a constant state in a constant process of training people how to be like the Lord. Now, are we ever going to be exactly like the Lord? We're not going to be deity. This is not some form of, uh, of, of likeness where we are going to become gods. That's not what I'm saying. The goal is to get us to behave as Christ behaved, to behave as God. And one of the things that I'm trying to do in this particular ministry is to set forth kind of a plan kind of a process by which we can train one another, by which we can learn from God's Word how to apply God's Word to our life and train other people how to be good Christians. Because to become a Christian, it takes faith alone and Christ alone. To be a good Christian, it takes effort. It takes effort. It takes work to be a good Christian. To be a follower of the Lord, this is a dedicated follower of Christ. So we need to have a plan. What's the plan? I don't think we should take this on whimsically. I think as we approach discipleship, we ought to have a goal in mind. The goal is to then train others to train others, right? Commit now to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That's the goal. So the goal is to this process of training. So that's the process of discipleship. We have, uh, we have the, uh, the practice of discipleship. The practice of discipleship. How do we carry out the practice of discipleship? Well, right now we're going through this book called Continue. And uh, this is a really neat book. This, uh, we just got through this book with uh, Donna and Andy. We were on, I don't know, a 20-week plan. It's supposed to be only 14 weeks, but we, we, we carried it out. I don't know, Samuel, we're on the 40-week plan, right? Yeah, you know we are. And uh, this is just a book that we use. It's just a book that we use to help kind of organize the content by which we disciple. So when you open up in this book, and this is kind of a fill in the blank, and all the answers are in the back. This is not meant to be a, a Bible college course, but we start off in week one by knowing the Word of God. Listen, friends, if this is not the Word of God, we are in trouble, aren't we? 
if this is not God's word, then what are we here for anyway? How many of you folks have leaves to rake in your yard right now? I have leaves to rake in my yard. I'd rather be there if this is not the word of God. Hmm. Now, can I say this? If this is the word of God, and it is, I can't think of a better place to be. So we talk about the Word of God. Secondly, uh, knowing God. Now that's that's big, isn't it? Knowing God? Not just knowing about God, but knowing God. That's like understanding why He does what He does. Not just what He does. There's a difference between what would Jesus do and then why would Jesus do what Jesus does, right? And so there's a big difference there. So this is knowing God, uh, salvation, yes, but also knowing Him on a more intimate level. Uh, then, week three, who is Jesus? If Jesus isn't God, we're in trouble. Because this book declares that Jesus is God. I have leaves to rake, friends. What are we doing here, right? I mean, Jesus has to be God. If he's, if he's not, then we're in trouble. So, I thank God that he is God, right? We talk about your salvation in week four, developing a prayer life in, in week five, your relationship with God's Word. Uh, uh, week 7 is the Holy Spirit. The life of a disciple in, uh, in chapter 8. Week 8, rather. Uh, or week, uh, yeah, week 9 is the local church. That's important. You're all here right now. It's called a local church. Because it's a local. Not crazy. We're not talking Spanish. Local, local. Is it local or local? Local. local. Okay, well, I don't even know Spanish. I feel it twice anyway. <laughs> So, uh, financial stewardship, week 11, in the offering, I said to you, you're the reason this is all here. I mean, obviously it's God. But God supplies your needs, and you supply the needs of the church. That's wonderful. Financial stewardship is great. Go and tell others, or to tell the good news to others. Uh, living in light of eternity. You're here today, right now, in this moment, because you're living in light of eternity. Because God's important, and you, you expect to meet Him someday. I expect to meet him someday. I will meet him. I will meet my Lord. This is a great book. And if I can encourage you to get into the continued promise, 14 weeks, technically, unless you're long-winded, like me, it takes a little longer to get through. But it's a wonderful book, and it's a structure. It's a strategy on discipleship. This is not the end of all, though. There's a whole lot more to discipleship than this book. It's really this book. This is really what discipleship is about. A committed follower of Jesus Christ. It's someone who is constantly in God's word, studying, excavating truth, applying that truth to your life. That's where the important thing comes in. So, this is the practice of discipleship. This is how we're practicing it right now in this local church. Because we're going through a book, a curriculum that helps us become better. And then the goal, the goal of this, is then as soon as you are taught, to take this book and then teach others. Because you would not be fulfilling the, fulfilling the Great Commission if you didn't teach others, because the Great Commission is for you to go teach others. Not for me to do all the teaching. It's multiplication, not addition. It's when you go out and you teach others about Christ, right? So this is a good book. It's not the end all, though. All right, well, listen to this. In conclusion, I just want to tell you real quickly, and then we're going to do the, the, uh, the communion. We're going to get around to this. Uh, but we keep pouring out all these little communion cups, and the kids, man, they love it. They're like, Dad, do we have to do communion again today? We try one more time. Because <laughs> they drink all the grape juice. And it is grape juice. They're not getting drunk on wine. They're just enjoying the grape juice. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your safe, you can know for sure, you can know for sure before you leave this place where you're going when you die. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful that I'm safe. I'm thankful that someone shared with me the plan of salvation. That is simply when I place my faith in what Jesus did on the cross, I can go to heaven. I'm also thankful that there's a plan for sanctification. That there's a plan for sanctification, a plan for spiritual development and growth. Many of you have had children in your life. You don't want your children to remain children. You want your children to grow up and rape your yard. <laughs> you want your children to grow up. You want them to grow up, to be taught as discipleship. 
These two are not to be confused with one another. Salvation is independent of sanctification. Salvation is once for all. You trusting Jesus, that he died on the cross for your sin. Sanctification is a process that you grow in through discipleship. And we need to be sharing this with people. This is one of the last part we're here today. Salvation and sanctification. But friends, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you believe in him today that he died on the cross for your sin, that Jesus, the Son of God, died on the cross for your sin, if you believe he was buried and rose again the third day, You can be saved. You can go to heaven when you die. Because of the work that he's done, not the work that you do for him. But brother, nobody leaves this place without trusting Christ.